So we want to talk a bit about this season. And um, as I was preparing for this um, and uh, kind of reflecting on, on the year that we just came from, I uh, wanted to mention a few things um, as far as the last season is concerned. Uh, kind of bringing you back for a second because I think it does set the tone for what's happening this year. So we're, we talked last year about the long-awaited Beethoven symphony cycle, which was a triumph, not just in Cleveland, but all over the world. Um, probably two of the most uh, important opera performances in the world last year between the revival of the Cunning Little Vixen and the concert version of Tristan und Isolde, Turan Galilean Symphony, Mahler 9, Haydn the Seasons, in both versions, the full version and the Versemers narrated version. <laughs> um, critical acclaim, not just in Cleveland, but in New York, in Vienna, all over Europe, and as far as Tokyo, um, including uh, wonderful acclaim from the Emperor and the Empress in Tokyo. The New York Times repeatedly calling this orchestra the finest orchestra in America. Record ticket sales and I could keep, I could keep going. So my first question for you, Franz, today is what do we do after a season like this and how do you approach programming the, the first season of the second century so that we don't lose the incredible momentum that we, that we had last year? You know, uh, I, I think one important part was really when we planned the centennial season was uh, not to have a sort of huge party and afterwards comes the big hangover. Um, so the good news is, you know, I'm now starting my season number 17 as music director and it's so interesting uh, that the repertoire is just so enormous and there's so much exciting stuff which I want to hear this orchestra play and haven't done yet, even though I'm here already for over 16 years now. So, um, you know, it, it was not a problem sitting there thinking, gosh, what should we do? Um, no, it, it, was, it was really, um, of course it looks very different than last season, and it should. And last season looked very different than the previous season. So it's, for, for me it's not a matter how to top last season. It's actually a matter of uh, keeping our curiosity as performers, but also about uh, as, a, as an audience. Let's start with tonight, because I think tonight's program is, is, is a really interesting way to, to start that season. Two new works in the first half. Tell us about how this came together and, and what we're about to hear this evening. You know, uh, this orchestra, uh, there's so much talent in this orchestra. Not just every individual player sitting in the chair where she or he sits, um, but when you, when you talk to the individual players, uh, you find out that one is extremely gifted in new technology, another one is extremely gifted in arts altogether, and so on and so on. And uh, when you look at the history of other orchestras, um, you find that sometimes there are players who actually are also very gifted composers. And we have one of them, Jeff Rathburn, and we thought it would be a nice touch um, that uh, moving forward uh, that we, we commission a piece from him. So this is the first piece on the program, and I, I think also, like we, we have done in, in previous years, uh, other great American orchestras opened their season with war horses. And uh, it's a tribute actually also to our audience, which I think is, is at least in America, and maybe, maybe even far beyond that, um, the most sophisticated audience you can get. 
So it's, uh, it's really a tribute also to this audience to play a new piece in, and Jeff, I think I would say, is in the tradition of great American composers like Copeland, like Bernstein, and, uh, and then playing a, a piano concerto by, I think, somebody who has a very unique, interesting voice. And some of you will remember three years ago when we, when we played the song cycle, Let Me Tell You, with Barbara Hennigan by Hans Abrahamson. And we took it also to New York, and, the, and uh, it was also there an amazing, um, an amazing success. And uh, I think part of, of our DNA in this institution is um, that we want to be not just looking back and being proud of what this institution has achieved, but understanding that uh, tradition means looking also into the future and moving forward. And so that contemporary music is not something where you say, <gasps> oh God, uh, it's uh, uh, some noise which I hate. Uh, no, it's, it's something uh, when you walk over to the museum and, and you see some of the contemporary art, uh, like in front of the museum, this, this one beautiful sculpture by Anish Kapoor, uh, you know, it's, it's artists of today also, and I think it's important, have to say something. And I think our job is also to be in a dialogue with that. And then, of course, you know, uh, on the second half, it's, it's fun. And music also should be fun, at least once in a while. Uh, to, to play a suite from Swan Lake. I was speaking to uh, Alexandre Tarot, who was our soloist in, in the Abramson uh, uh, this week, and he's making his debut with us, so it's a new artist for us. And he was telling me he's the one uh, who commissioned that piece, so uh, Abramson wrote the piece for him. And he was telling me that this is, I believe, the ninth performance of this concerto already, uh, which tells you something about the uh, contemporary work that is already in such demand, and I think it's a testimony to Abramson's uh, uh, compositions that are both very complex, very sophisticated, yet really uh, with real public appeal, and I think we'll hear that this evening. Now, a few more words about, about modern works of France. We have about, I think, 10 works this season, and we're all season that we're uh, either playing for the first time in Cleveland or world premiere or US premiere. Um, big names, you know, in addition to Abramson and, and Jeff's tonight, John Adams and Matthias Pincher and, and uh, Jennifer Higdon and people like that. Uh, but we also have a new uh, young composer, Mr. Deutsch, who's the new Lewis Composer Fellow. Tell us a bit about that program and about uh, that composer in particular, because we've identified and I would dare to say launched major composer careers over the past few years to this program. I, I think, again, I, I refer back to, to the DNA of, of this institution. Uh, we actually want to be, also in that field, we want to be leaders for the classical music world. And, and I'm really proud of that, that with the Daniel Lewis uh, Young Composer Fellowship, uh, since we started that, a lot of them have become real international household names, starting with uh, the first commission was Kaya Sariaho, you know, uh, and it was Orion, uh, which was in September 2002 when we played it, and, and it has been performed basically by every major symphony orchestra in this world. And uh, Matthias Pincher, Jörg Wittmann, uh, Marc-André Dalbavi, and so on and so on. Uh, it's, it's a really impressive list. And this, this uh, young guy, Mr. Deutsch, uh, came to our attention. You know, we have our, our network, people telling us who is up and coming. And we, we looked at it and, and uh, thought, 
That's that's really interesting, and it, and also we we established a policy to give the orchestra and the audience a chance, really to get into that specific language of a composer that we in the season before we we commissioned someone something from that a younger composer uh, that we perform a piece of his or her. And in this case, it's an organ concerto, and I'm, I'm thrilled simply because uh, we are also blessed with one of the greatest instruments <laughs> in, the, in the classical music world with, with our organ here, and, and also um, getting back uh, somebody who I would consider by now really part of our artistic family, uh, Paul Jacobs, uh, who is this, and I know you have heard him, this really wonderful, wonderful organ player, really unique in our world. I think this, this point about how special Severance Hall is with the organ and, and the hall itself um, will be featured prominently this season because our upcoming gala on, on, on September 29th will be recorded and broadcast on PBS Great Performances later on this year. Um, tell us briefly, Franz, about this program. It's a one night only with Lang Lang, who's, who's a good friend of ours, of course. Um, what can we expect for those of us who will be there that evening? Um, when we put this program together, of course, uh, you always need, uh, for, for a gala, you need a, a star soloist uh, and uh, Lang Lang, <laughs> I just uh, performed with him at the Vienna Philharmonic last week in, in Amsterdam, and... Um, He's okay, by the way, right? He's yeah, fine. you know, yeah. Well, he, he was injured last year. He didn't pay for many, many months, yeah. Yeah, he, he played, he didn't play almost for a year. You know, he, he had injured his left hand, and um, uh, it, was, it was a very slow and, and for him painful process to come back and and uh, I know him it, it's really funny I, th I think from all the internationally established conductors I'm the one who knows him longer than anybody else because he uh, a manager who who I respect enormously uh, said you have to listen to this guy and that was in 99, he was 15 then, and uh, he, he played for me and, and it was astonishing. And he has this really soft spot for, for Cleveland and, and he actually always tells me, I come to Cleveland because I can learn something there. So we are going to do the, the Mozart C minor concerto and then the rest of the program is sort of, of course, showing off the orchestra with the symphonic suite from Frau ne Schatten by Richard Strauss um, and uh, a Viennese waltz and finishing with uh, La Valls which, uh, by Ravel, which is a, a big showcase for the orchestra. So September 29th, uh, the gala is completely sold out, I'm sorry for those of you who are not uh, there, but the concert still has tickets, so uh, you certainly can hear that concert. Now, Franz, let's, one of the themes that we have this season is, is um, featuring the works of Schubert and Prokofiev. Um, let, uh, tell us about why these two composers and, and why, in some cases, pair these two composers. You know, this is, is sort of the start of a longer project where, which will go over a couple of seasons. Um, both, I mean, I, I don't have to explain that, but Schubert is, is really extremely close to my heart. And of course, the unfinished and the great C major uh, symphonies, they get played regularly, but uh, what about the first six symphonies? where he, he actually is already such a master. Uh, and Prokofiev, you hear number one and number five regularly. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was talking to the Musikverein in Vienna as we're next season, we're going to take uh, four Prokofiev symphonies on the road. 
and uh, it was interesting. We looked into the history of performances of Prokofiev symphonies in the world famous Vienna Musik Verein. Number one and number five, yes. Never played their number two, three and four. Never having been performed in, in, in the Musik Verein. And number six, the last time was in 1983. I was there, standing room ticket. It was the Leningrad Philharmonic with uh, their, I think, 47 years uh, music director, Yevgeny Mravinsky. And uh, Prokofiev Seven last time in the Musik Verein uh, was performed in 1961 by a conductor named Herbert von Karajan. So it's, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's like also music history and history all together sort of goes in phases. And um, as we're in two weeks down the road, we are playing Mahler too. Mahler's music for a long time was not recognized till really the mid 60s where it became popular. Um, then, in, still in the 60s and 70s, you would hear in big orchestral concerts mu much more Richard Strauss, and then that would go down, and you would hear more Gustav Mahler's music. And the same is, is like with uh, Prokofiev's music, and, and I think both of them, Schubert and Prokofiev, have on one side this very sort of classical approach in their music, their writing, and, but beneath you, you hear that both of them were very lonesome figures. And, and that's what, what I think when, when you really listen to the emotional side of, of this, uh, both composers, you, you can grasp uh, something which they have in common. Let's move on to opera. So um, every year, as you know, we present an opera. It's, it's a highlight of the season. Um, this year you chose Ariadne of Naxos by, by Strauss. Why Ariadne? And I would ask, is there a thread there? What, you know, when looking at the operas that we've performed over the, the, the last few years, what, what, what do they have in common, these, the, these operas? Nothing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Uh, no, the, the, the thing, and I've said this before, the reason why we started doing that was simply to um, nurture qualities in the orchestral play. Flexibility, singing sound. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, there's different repertoire, and uh, I refer to a comment I made in the beginning. Uh, there's so much, which actually is the good news, uh, which uh, is wonderful. And, you know, this orchestra is, when it comes to the music of, of Richard Strauss, we have done Elektra here, we have done Salome here, we have done Rosenkavalier here, we have done Daphne here. Uh, it's It's this orchestra has this sort of silvery shimmer, which suits uh, the music of, of Richard Strauss really well. And this orchestra also, uh, on each position, you have people who are actually also solistically really great. Now you have to know Ariadne, the orchestra is only 40 players, everyone six violins, four violas, uh, four cellos. Um, everyone is really solistic. And I think that will be, for, for the ones who play that, will be a really nice challenge. Besides, we are, Ariadne is an opera about an opera. So there's this rich man and he, he wants, he commissions a young composer to write an opera. And this young composer is full of enthusiasm, and of course he wants to write something profound, and uh, it should be tragic. 
and then uh, the head of staff, you would say, uh, the house of Meister, comes and says, no, actually, my boss wants an opera which should be tragic, but also a comedy. And uh, the whole thing gets a little complicated and you, you have on one side these people which are in the tradition of an Italian comedy and you have on the other side uh, Richard Strauss was, was a huge fan of, of uh, great mythology. You have figures out of that like Ariadne and um, and so it's uh, it's a funny mix of both, but what what is uh, the music is is uh, beyond sublime. It's it's so beautiful, and uh, how a genius like like Richard Strauss can write sort of a tragedy and a comedy within one piece is unique. It's really unique, and and I think we are actually staging it again, and it will be fun because the first half, where all this uh, happens, where where the young composer wants to write this tragic piece, and then uh, the interference comes and says, you know, you have to write something funny, and and you have the personnel of the opera, a prima donna and the tenor, and, and it's all sort of very characteristic for, for the opera business. And uh, the way the director is going to stage it is that the orchestra will be also part of that in, in, in the first part after intermission, then the actual opera, which the young composer has written, gets performed. Uh, so I, I think it will be a fun experience f for everyone. It's, it's uh, after having done Tristan, which is not a comedy, uh, I think it's, it's fun to look at the huge spectrum which we have in, in, in the arts and, and look at something which is a little more lighthearted. And the director you refer to is Frederick Wake Walker, someone who will be working with us for the first time, but with whom you've worked in, in Europe. Yeah, we, uh, he, he's a young British uh, director, and we did uh, together at La Scala in Milan, Le Nozze di Figaro, and um, he, he, he did a really great job there. It, it was very difficult because there was this famous old production of, of Le Nozze di Figaro, which uh, he, he was one of the greatest directors of the 20th century, Giorgio Strehler did, and uh, that had become such an icon that the very conservative audience in, in Milan was, was sort of anti new production of Le Nozze di Figaro. We wouldn't know about this in this country. That never happens here. <laughs> yeah. But it, in the end, it, it, it was, a, was a great success and, and really beautifully done. So I, I think he's one um, of the most interesting young guys there is in, in, in the opera world uh, concerning directors. One of the many topics I enjoyed uh, discussing with you, Franz, is um, when we speak about works that you have yet to conduct. Um, and it's always a surprise to me, and I would, I, would, uh, I would assume a surprise to our audience, how many works you conduct for the very first time in Cleveland each season. So unlike many conductors who, especially established conductors who basically stick to the same repertoire all the time because, you know, let's face it, learning new repertoire is a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of risks. Um, you, every year, make a point of bringing works that you've never conducted before, major works. So tell us about a few of these works this season because some of them are, and I'm not talking about the, the commissions, obviously, the new, the new pieces. I'm on, talking about established works from the repertoire. Um. You know, first of all, uh, uh, to your point, I, I think it's, uh, it's important that uh, 
you keep yourself young via that, <laughs> learning something and not just repeating. And, and uh, you know, like what I admired, for instance, about uh, Sir George Schulte was that he made a point that he learned to the very last day of his life, you could say, he, every year he learned at least one new piece. And uh, like tonight, besides the two new works, but I've never conducted Swan Lake. Next week, I've, I've never conducted Prokofiev I. Um, what else are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking now because, you know, I, I, I sort of don't go, oh my God, I have to learn something new. For, for me, it's, it's really a joy um, to get to know another masterpiece. Or in, in January, when, when we uh, perform Ariadne of Naxos, at the same time we're playing a program with sort of the other half of, of the orchestra, a Mozart divertimento, which I've never done, and, and a wonderful work of uh, Richard Strauss uh, called The Happy Workshop, uh, a suite, a big suite for winds only. I had never done that one, and uh, then we're into um, the, the Deutsch uh, organ, concerto or Weben six pieces for orchestra something which I wanted to do for a long time and so you know you have your wish list and then you you make a program for a season and then you realize that how many pieces from that wish list have not made it into this season um, and then you you just keep trying and also at the very end of of the season, the last program with Simon Kindleside as a soloist, um, the suite from Per Gint, the Sibelius songs, or Aus Italien by Strauss. It's the entire you. program I've never done before. Remarkable. Let's um, move to touring for a minute. Um, this season, we're not going to Europe for the first time in, in quite a few years, but we're going to China. And that's the first time the Cleveland Orchestra goes to China in 17 years. So in many ways, it's, it's our first time to what I would call the new China in, in, in many ways. What does that mean for you as, as an artist to, to go perform um, in China? Uh, you know, <laughs> looking at, at our business, uh, also in, in the classical music world, China is an extremely fast-growing market. And, uh, you know, if you, if you, because we were talking about Lang Lang, um, he has on Twitter 11 million followers in China only. That tells you something. And I don't know how many million kids now are learning piano in China. It's, um, I was in, in Shanghai uh, last December, after Christmas, uh, between Christmas and New Year. And um, it's amazing. They just say, okay, you know, um, we are building a new opera house. Uh, and, and how many cities in the last 10, 15 years have gotten new concert halls? It's, it's amazing. So uh, it, it's something where I think we, we have to present ourselves. I think we have time for one last question. And, sorry. Sorry. My experience, which I loved about Shanghai, was you know when concert when people sit in the concert, and um, and nowadays they take out their iPhones or iPads, and they want to take a little video or a photograph. There are people in the back employees who actually have a green laser pointer. You will not see green laser pointer at Sarens <laughs> Hall, I promise you. Too bad, I was hoping for that. No, no, I'm kidding. But I, 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 I think it's, uh, I mean, it says a lot about China anyway, but uh, I, I think it's, um, 
we, we live in a time where, where we have this sort of parallel world and uh, with uh, social media and all that. And uh, it's a reminder that what's important, going to a concert, and what I also loved about the two concerts I conducted there was lots of young kids. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's a big thing now in the education of, of Chinese people to embrace classical music. It's wonderful. One last question, Franz. We, um, no one's told you that, but when you're not in Cleveland, we do have guest conductors coming here <laughs> now. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you can't be here all, every week of the season, so we don't have a choice. Um, I'm curious, if you had to pick one or two concerts as an audience member that you're not conducting, which ones would you pick this season? Um, I looked through the program and it's, it's hard to make a choice because, you know, as I said, uh, what, what I love about this place and uh, which suits me so well is, is the curiosity. Um, so I, I looked through the season's program and the first one which came to my mind was end of October, Peleas and Melisande, and you have Webernberg and Schoenberg and people will go, ooh, 12-tone music. The big news is it's all late romantic music. It's actually the only real 12-tone piece and not academically sort of worked through is, is the berg Valen concerto on, the, on this program. But actually Weber Passacale is a late romantic piece and, and so is Peleas and Melisande. And, and then I, I looked further and, you know, there's always, there are several reasons why you want to go to a concert. Sometimes it's the program and sometimes it's a performer. And in this case, I just, I love many acts. And so I, I would go to that one when he, when he comes middle of November. And then um, one program which I would die to hear because I've never heard that piece live uh, is the Busoni Piano Concerto, which is, it's a monster, but a very beautiful monster. And, and Garrick Olsen, who is one of the very, very few people who actually can play that because it's, it's so virtuoso. That's with a male, male chorus on top of everything else. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a sort of piece over the top. And, and then um, the last one, if I would have to pick one, is, is in uh, end of April, the, um, when Jean-Yves Thibaudet who for me is also really one, one of the great pianists of today, uh, when he comes, um, that program I, I also would love to hear. So you've heard it first uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, Franz Welsamer's uh, concert recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Franz. Thank you all, and have a great season. Thank you very much. <laughs>